Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a new weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. We'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week, we'll learn about the city of Nisswa and the history behind its train depot. A local Bemidji potter shows us his take on Southern folk art pottery. And we'll introduce you to a jewelry artist who owns her very own unique boutique in downtown Bemidji, which features other local artists. I am going to be making a necklace today. Maybe a set of matching earrings. I've uh, pre-chosen some beads that I want to use. It's actually a um, custom ordered piece by a close friend of the family for a Christmas present for uh, a friend's daughter. I mean, it really starts off with, okay, I, so I want to use one of these and I'll put it down and I'll go through each bin and kind of pick things out and have a pile and then I subtract from it. So I'll usually start with a piece that I know I want to use, like a focal point or maybe a really specific larger bead that I want to be really prominent within the piece. And I have all of my beads separated into kind of categories. The main thing I work with is stones. Um, this is Labradorite, this is Moonstone, uh, two of my favorite stones. Um, so that, that's what I have the most of, and um, I have a lot of bins with just stones in them, and I, I try to keep them very organized. But I usually have everything kind of color coordinated throughout there. So then I'll start saying, okay, so I really want to use that. Well, what goes with this? And I'll go through all my stones, and it, the reason I have it in color order is because then I can say, okay, so I'm working with a brown, brown tones right now. So I can say, well, here are my browns, and well, here's some whites that might go and other things that I want to coordinate with that. I also have some antique and kind of vintage things. I always try and keep my eye out for kind of unique things. And they really, I think, complement what I do. I'm always learning new techniques. It's a big part of uh, my passion for making jewelry. Uh, I was, I've started learning enameling, and so I have that in my glass box here. So I make a lot of enamel pendants. I also have an entire bin of freshwater pearls, which come in a million different colors. I love freshwater pearls. They are really funky. Purple, that's so cool. I really like them because you can get some really wild colors like and hot pink. Um, another favorite of mine are the faceted freshwater pearls. Um, these red ones are my favorite. This one is primarily bone, horn, and wood pieces. These coconut tusks are some of my favorite things. Um, I have these large brown ones and black ones. When I find them, I usually go crazy and I buy all that I can get my hands on. When using a flexible beading wire, um, you can't tie a knot in it at all. So you use these little beads called print beads. Well, actually this is a crimp tube. <laughs> so, crimp bead on the wire. This is my link. This is the larger loop on the end of my link. And I'm going to strand that through. I take the end of my flexible beading wire and I run it back through my link. Like that. Then I'm gonna pull my loose end and scoot it close to my beads. I'm actually going to run it through one of my beads. And then I just tug a little, get it nice and snug through my crimp bead and a couple of the beads I have right at the end. That just adds a little extra strength to it. And zip. 
nice and snug, but not too snug. Now that I have all my pieces connected, I have my focal point. So I start by making my link with my little tail. Um, before I wrap that, I have to make sure to connect it. So I have the start of my necklace here, and I just slide that link right on there into the loop. And now I can wrap. And I will do that for every link on this necklace. I do really hope the person I'm making this for <laughs> likes it. If she doesn't, I'll try something else. <laughs> Usually, that doesn't happen. Well, we've come a long way with this piece. Um, so I'm gonna measure it right now and see how long it is. Uh, I don't have a clasp on here. It's about 15 and a half inches. Um, generally, a necklace that sits right at the base of the throat is 16 inches. I want this one to hang down a little bit more. So I'm going to have to add a, a few more links on each side, and then I'm going to attach my clasp. So, um, I remember being asked what you wanted to be when you grew up, and I said I wanted to be a jeweler. This piece is almost complete. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add one more wire wrap link to each side of the necklace, and when I do those, I'm going to be attaching my clasp. All right, I'm gonna do the same thing and attach the ring of my clasp. So one last snip, one last little adjustment, and this piece is finished. I am squeaky wheel pottery. I started clay when I was a little kid. Uh, my dad used to have a pottery studio here and uh, he made all these bird feeders and, and different things. And clay is all a whole bunch of different platelets like this in there. And by wedging it, it uh, takes all those platelets and uh, organizes them. And once they're organized, then, then they'll make a nice flow when you go to throw it on the wheel. Clay likes to flow like mud or uh, water, or, and, it, and it flows through your fingers to go up to make a, a vessel. So by organizing the platelets like that, it really uh, it really helps with the river of clay or the flow. So there's these holes in the wheel head, and these and these bolts just stick to them. And then one of these nice little round boards. This is going to be a ugly face whiskey jug. I just push in with my left hand and give it some counter pressure with the right one. And it kind of naturally just finds its, its center. Now this is going to be the very bottom of my pot. So I want to make sure I know where I'm going to have a bottom one. Well, if I, if I open too far with it, the, uh, when I go to cut it off the bat with the wire tool, the, there won't be a bottom in it. It'll have a big hole. I got it open pretty nice now, and I still got this pretty straight. Um, I want to give it some good counter pressure to really compress the bottom. If you don't get the bottom nice and compressed, there ends up being a, a crack. Um, kind of goes back to dealing with the clay platelets and, and how, you know, it doesn't matter how much you wedge them, you're still not going to get them all going in the right direction or, or working together. I don't know if you ever really master it. You know, like I say, I started as a little kid, but I, uh, doing clay and clay sculptures and didn't really start doing wheel throwing until I went to college. So I, I'd probably say I've probably been throwing now for almost 10 years. Now the top has a little bit of a wobble in it, and I'll just cut that off. And to stiffen that up a little bit, I'll use a little bit of fire. And as for that hardness on the outside, really acts like an armature in keeping this pot stand upright. Because this will now become the top of the pot, the part that's on the back. This part will intersect with what I already have. This was a little bigger ball than the first ball. I kind of work this clay up, kind of more wedging get those uh, molecules going in the right direction. Not bad. Well, I almost have two pots that I turned into one. Now this is kind of thick at the top, but down in the middle, 
it's, you know, about so thick. So what I want to do now is I want to torch that lower part and then I can throw the top again. Uh, I, I model a lot of my ugly face whiskey jugs after the southern uh, whiskey jugs done around the 1800s, um, primarily by black potters. Um, but there have been face jugs and, and jugs like this done in the Middle Ages and uh, the ones done around the 1800s, there was a, a belief that they held a spiritual significance for the artists uh, that threw them. Some stories went that the potters would throw these jugs and fill them full of whiskey, put them on a grave or a burial mound, and uh, if the jug went undisturbed for a whole year, then the soul had passed to the next world without any disturbance. There's other stories that say that potters put these ugly faces on jugs to keep the children from sipping the whiskey for fear their face would turn and they would look like the creature on the jug. This is going to be that neck now for that one. It fits between those calipers, so that's good because this pot is going to shrink 14% between now and when it's all the way finished. Soap makes the water more slippery, and with the water more slippery, you're able to get by using less water. The less water you use, the uh, less fatigued your clay will get. Now, I usually like to grind some big lines into this just to give it some visual interest right here at the throat. Some would say those are throw marks, or uh, you know, but I like the way they, they give it some visual, a little more visual interest right here at the at the neck and soften it up a little bit with my sponge. I'm scoring this. I got this special little uh, fork that I found at the thrift store. It's just like perfect for doing this. Now this is porcelain. And I use porcelain for the teeth and the eyeballs so that it's white when it's fired. I sell a lot of my stuff by going to different craft shows. I really just recently started getting into Renaissance festivals, and I really like those. The type of thing that I do seems to fit real well. It's, you know, it's a lot of fun to get dressed up like a, an old medieval person and, and talk the language, and uh, just to be a part of it. It's just something that's so much different than a normal art fair. Make a big coil here for that upper lip. I also, you know, sold some galleries, sold a significant amount online. Even the stuff I sell to some of the galleries, they seem to do pretty well um, selling it online. Kind of just sculpting it back and forth as I'm going there, trying to make it conform over the tops of those teeth, trying to make a real interesting edge. Kind of only, I'm only smoothing this out on the back side away from the teeth. Leaves me that nice rounded edge by the teeth, you know, that maintains that, that look of a lip. Now I go over this with a sponge. Some of that where I was pushing it out, there was thick and thin. Really gotten into this carving the, the line in there. Give it a little more depth. I think that makes it pretty interesting when you get it like that. So I'm just trying to make some cheeks here. More of a defined cheek where all the teeth were. Some of, something that helps blend that all together is if you get some lines coming down into it, uh, matching up with those lines before from the lower jaw. I'm gonna try 
try to get this one pointed down a little more. You know, both sides of the shrug shouldn't be the same. Most people don't. When they smile, one side is higher or lower or bigger or smaller than the other side. And I try to echo that a lot when I do these jugs. I spend a lot of time really studying different people's faces. You know, no individual jug is modeled after one individual person. You know, I want to give it some definition here by the nose. You know, disfigurements are starting to become more interesting to me. Disfigurements are um, moles and warts and things like that. No always ends up being a pretty big addition, so I, again, I gotta do a bunch of scoring uh, to get it to attach good and stay on there. By the time the nose gets done, I'll probably end up with it out a good couple inches from the face of this piece. I'm trying my best to make this guy look happy. I kinda, I don't know what it is, but I end up making so many of them that look so sad or mean or something. It looks pretty happy, but I, I keep telling myself, make a happy jug. Don't, don't, don't let him get sad looking. That looks pretty good. This piece will go to leather hard, and then I will bisque fire it, which means I'll fire it to about 1800 degrees. At that point, the clay won't dissolve in water anymore. It's, it's been fired hot enough that it's changed. The, they call that a, a quartz inversion has taken place. And get that point up there. If you're going to start this as a hobby, you know, take a class somewhere, um, you know, trying to get started into this on your own. There's some pretty basic things that, that a person should really take a class to learn, uh, one of which is firing a kiln. If you don't know how to fire your kiln, you'll never end up with any pottery that you'll get to keep. And just what you would want to do and what you'd want to get into, if you took a class, it would immerse you in so many different firing techniques and surfaces, different things that you can do. You know, I mean, I suppose you can learn it from, from a book or a videotape too, but uh, definitely taking a class would be how I would suggest it. It's hard to make something look random. That's probably about the hardest thing with doing these faces is you get to something like hair and, uh, you know, either eyebrows or mustaches or Sometimes I even put hair on the top of the piece um, to give it that look where it's it's random, like hair. Hair is pretty random. But then when I finally put the pupil in, I should kind of get it like this. I've seen potters put stamps at the base of their handle. Sometimes down here at the base of the handle, I'll make this little eyeball kind of a punctuation that a person probably wasn't expecting. The thing I like most about pottery is uh, it's so wide, it's so vast. There's so many different things you can do, all the way from different forming techniques to different glazes and firings. Everything you do has a, an impact on the final end piece. Ta-da! As the country was built, if a railroad came, you had a town that sprang up around it. Nisswa is much the same. Nisswa started off named Smiley, and it was named because Ernest P. Smiley incorporated the post office. He applied in the name of Hills Crossing because Webb Hill is who we consider was our first resident of what we consider Nisswa. There was a hills crossing in Minnesota already, so they just named it arbitrarily Smiley and sent it back. The original post office was down about eight blocks. If you know about railroads, 
they have to have a certain grade to do things right and to start off. That was on too much of a hill so that when they stopped there, it was difficult for them to get going again. They'd have to back up as many as a couple of blocks. So when Smiley left town, they moved the depot up to where it is now, and then they renamed the town Niswa, which of course means three in Ojibwe. The depot is why we're here. The trains brought everything up here. Until the mid-20s, it was really the only way to get here. The train originally came through Hubert rather than Niswa, so the early uh, homesteaders, uh, anybody that was coming here, always ended up at Hubert rather than, than Niswa in the very, very early days around you know, 1901, 1905 and, and through there. The railroad, when it came, went right through here, went past us, but when they got to Lakeshore, they realized that they couldn't get to where they wanted to go, which was Walker, but, uh, because there was too much swamp and too many hills. So they ripped up the track after they had just built a 600-foot trestle. That's good planning. <laughs> and uh, they came back and they turned up from Hubert through Niswa. So that's why Niswa became the city that it was. The depot is different in that as they first came here, we were a poor land with poor people and it was a poor railroad. So our depot was built in five different segments. They built it when they had the money to do it. And they started out with this little depot, and this is now the waiting room of our depot. Uh, that, this was put up in 1907. In 1910, they changed this to a hip roof and made an open air waiting station behind it. And of course, the reason for that was it went from logging and freight only to people coming to all the resorts, so they needed a place for them to uh, sit or wait for the train. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they didn't have the money, so they just left it open there. That went to 38 feet. Then they needed a baggage room, so they built a baggage room at the end of that and left the middle as a waiting room, open air, and that extended to roughly 52 feet. Then they needed the uh, ticket office or the agent's office. They went into the middle open section and built him an office. Then finally in 1937, they filled the whole thing in in the Sadipo you see standing today. The town was uh, here, was logged over. So once the logging was gone, we were lucky because we had a real good railroad system that went through us. And then, of course, we had all these beautiful lakes. We had launch services. You would be taken from the depot down to the public landing, and the launch would take you to all of the resorts along the west side of Gull. We had the way to get here, and luckily we had people who were good in the hospitality business. Uh, there was a special train called the Paul Bingen Special that ran here. A lot of the people went off. There was a popular nightclub here called the Spotlight Nightclub. They would get off here, and then, of course, they'd go on to Bemidji because the Bemidji, again, had a lot of um, uh, resorts and that type of thing, too. Uh, Smokey Joe's, uh, <clears throat> Joe Zacharias was a, uh, had barbecue, which they said it's the best barbecue that anybody ever had. Unfortunately, the, the recipe died with him. One of the better supper clubs in the whole state of Minnesota was Moran's. Uh, the uh, stories go, as they do up here, that she did cater to the uh, Chicago gangsters and she was a really gutsy old gal because at one point they were having a, a dinner. She was famous for her dumplings and uh, there was somehow a turkey bone got in a dumpling that got lodged in a, uh, a gangster from Chicago's throat and uh, not batting an eye, she took him in the kitchen, laid him on the table and did a tracheotomy. So he continued to eat and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> she was a magnificent woman and uh, uh, ran a, a wonderful <laughs> restaurant. At one point, we had probably a couple hundred of the small, what they called ma and pa 
uh, resorts. And they'd be from four to six cabins, uh, maybe as many as 12. In many ways, the hospitality of the people who ran these resorts, you, you were made to feel welcome. They did everything they could to make sure you got fish, made sure you, you know, ate well. And then now the reason they want to come here is the, the amenities. And of course, that's why the larger uh, resorts have, have blossomed. Over these years, we've come a long way. We started with the land, which was poor, poor people, and a poor railroad. And from that, we've managed to build a thriving community, a very well-to-do with fine resorts, wonderful restaurants, and beautiful summer homes. We're very proud of where we were, and we're proud of what we become. We hope that you enjoyed this week's Art and History segments. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.